All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another online lecture brought to you by the AMSSM Fellow Online Education Committee. Tonight, we have a very special guest, Dr. Benedict Wanchuku, who's an orthopedic hip preservation specialist to talk about femoral acetabular impingement with some non-op and operative management. So I'll be your moderator tonight, Dr. Myra Liu. And then before, let me make sure that you can see all this, okay. Before we get into today's lectures, I wanna remind you to come back next week for another online lecture with Dr. Oseguera, who will be presenting common HWNT uh, conditions in athletes with Dr. Matthew Wise as the moderator. And this national lecture is sponsored by the AMSSM Education and Fellowship Committee. The purpose of these lectures is to serve as an adjunct to your individual's program, educational programming, and provide fellows with direct access to educational experiences uh, with experienced AMSSM members, as well as today, like invited special guests. Um, these lectures help assist in CAQ exam preparation. Okay, and some of the ground rules. Um, as a reminder that if you haven't already, please mute your device's microphones and turn off your video. And after the program, please complete the evaluation, which will be sent out in the chat. Um, and then please submit any questions throughout the lecture that you might have in the chat function and include your name and your program if you wish. Um, and we will try to get to them at the end of the presentation. So it's my pleasure of introducing our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Benedict Wanchuku. Dr. Benedict Wanchuku is an orthopedic surgeon and spe specialist in hip, knee, and shoulder surgery at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City. Dr. Dr. Wanchuku is the co-director of clinical research for the Sports Medicine Institute at HSS. He is also an associate professor of orthopedic surgery at the Wheel Cornell Medical College. And Dr. Wanchuku attended college at Columbia University and he obtained his MD from Harvard Medical School. He also obtained his MBA from Harvard Business School while a medical student. Dr. Wanchuku completed his orthopedic surgery residency at HSS in his sports medicine fellowship training at the world-renowned Rush University. He has extensive experience caring for athletes. He currently serves as a team physician with the New York Liberty, um, as well as the medical consultant to the National Basketball Players Association. He has been a team physician for the Chicago Bulls, Chicago White Sox, and DePaul Athletics. As an undergraduate at Columbia, Dr. Wanchuku was a four-year starter as a men's basketball team and as such has a passion for working with athletes and individuals motivated to stay in the game. So Dr. Wanchuku's clinical and research interests are focused on returning athletes to sport as well as joint preservation. So Dr. Wanchuku, with that, I will now pass you the screen. Myra, thank you very much for the um, kind introduction. Um, I will um, <clears throat> present my slides, and um, it's a true honor to um, be presenting today. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, the AMSSM um, for uh, inviting me to present, and also my uh, colleague, Dr. James Robinson, um, who's a uh, non non-operative sports medicine colleague that uh, he takes care of the liberty with me, and he nominated me. Um, to present to you all today. So uh, hoping to share a little bit about uh, the way that I think about uh, femoral acetabular impingement or FAI um, and hip pain. And there will be opportunity for you all to ask questions. So please feel free to submit um, uh, questions for me to answer at the end of the talk. Um, so my disclosure is that I am a, a consultant with um, Stryker uh, and I am a founder and CEO of a telehealth company called Best in Class MD. So let's get into it. Let's talk about hip and groin pain. And so, you know, our understanding of hip pain has really evolved uh, quite significantly over the last 24 years, past several decades. Um, you know, the x-ray below is, um, you know, the hip on the right, the right hip. That's That's sort of what our understanding of hip pain was in the late 1990s, early 2000s. It was either hip arthritis or it wasn't. And, you know, the left hip 
um, represents what we understand now in terms of hip pain. There's a lot of things that can cause pain in the hip uh, beyond uh, osteoarthritis of the hip. And so uh, specifically, we now have a better grasp of the non-arthritic causes of hip pain, the most common being FAI, femoral acetabular impingement. And so what is FAI? Um, so FAI is a condition where there is abnormal contour of the femoral head and neck. And the most common type of femoral acetabular impingement is a cam deformity, uh, which we can see uh, shown here in the upper right on the x-ray. Uh, and the concept of a cam deformity is that you know, it's similar to putting a square peg in a round hole. And as a result, you get increased hip stiffness and damage to the hip joint. And the interesting thing about cam deformities is that it's actually really quite prevalent. Uh, you know, this is one of the early studies looking at the prevalence of hip impingement and cam deformities. And you can see that it's present in 41% of high level athletes. And um, this is another study. And this study looks at the prevalence of hip impingement in the highest level of athletes. So you, they looked specifically at elite hockey players and they compared them to controls. And what they saw was that um, in elite hockey players, there's a 75% prevalence of cam deformities. And so this actually suggests that the better you are at your sport, the more likely you are to have hip impingement. And so there's a number of you know, hypotheses around this being that um, people who tend to be better at their sport have been playing sport, um, you know, for a long time and that they are impinging through the hip or creating stresses through the hip that leads to them developing a cam deformity. Some people have actually offered that a cam deformity um, can actually help with levering and, and um, creating power through the hip. And so a cam actually selects for a better athlete. And so hopefully I've now convinced you that, you know, hip impingement and cam deformities are highly prevalent. And you're going to say, well, 75% of elite athletes have hip impingement, cam deformities, 41% of, you know, just regular athletes have it. Why, why should I care? Um, well, we know that hip impingement has upstream and downstream effects. Upstream from the hip is the spine and downstream is the knee. And so we actually call the upstream effect on the spine, hip spine syndrome. Uh, and this is a study that I was involved in at HSS, one of the early studies connecting the hip and the lumbar spine. And in this study, we essentially showed that patients with hip impingement have an increased presence of lumbar spine and back disorders. And the reason for this is that the spine ends up compensating for the lack of movement through the hips. And so the spine and the hip are one motion segment. And so the motion that you're not able to get through your hip um, you end up trying to get that and compensating for that through your spine. And we call that spinopelvic motion. With regard to the knee, this is another study out of, out of HSS. And in this study, the authors looked at players in the NFL combine, and they tracked these players and their career and career injury risk. And what the author showed was that patients who had stiff hips and who had hip impingement had a five times increased risk for ACL injury during the course of their career. Um, and this, uh, the graph on the bottom right basically shows that um, the more internal rotation or the more motion that someone has in their hip, the less of a risk they are to have an ACL injury. And subsequent research from this showed that this increased risk of an ACL injury for people who have impingement is really as a result of the landing mechanics. And so when you don't have appropriate range of motion through your hip, there's increased torque on the knee um, as you landed uh, from the jump. And so beyond the impact of FAI on the spine and the knee, um, the upstream and downstream effects, we know that hip impingement ultimately can lead to arthritis as a result of that mechanical conflict. And so that's part of the reason why we care so much about FAI and hip impingement. So let's switch gears. And, you know, before we hone in on FAI, hip impingement, let's talk about general causes of hip pain. You know, you don't want to be myopic and only think about um, hip impingement. When I see patients in the office, I generally will have a comprehensive list of diagnoses on my differential diagnosis list. And I'll mentally sift through these as I gather the history and examine the patient. Because of the centrality of the hip, 
you know, there can be significant overlap in a small area and there can be a variety of diagnoses contributing to hip pain. I think I, I'm probably biased because I, I treat hip pathology, but I think that getting a, a good, accurate diagnosis um, for hip pain is probably one of the more challenging um, areas in musculoskeletal pathology. So I like to break it down by thinking about the three different regions of hip pain. So anterior hip pain or groin pain, um, common causes of that are FAI, osteoarthritis, dysplasia, loose bodies inside of the joint, synovitis, which is just general inflammation of the synovium, cartilage defects inside the hip, or psoas impingement. Um, then there can be the less common things, sports hernia, ostitis pubis, and hip flexor tendonitis. And then, you know, don't forget about pelvic floor dysfunction and some of the gynecologic causes of anterior hip pain. And then when you think about posterior hip pain, you know, you have to think about your hamstring, piriformis syndrome, referred pain from the hip joint itself can actually refer to the posterior aspect of the hip in 15% of the cases. You can think about glute medius pathology and SI joint pain. And then lateral pain tends to be, you know, your trochanteric bursitis, uh, glute med and minimus. And obviously don't forget about the lumbar spine because the lumbar spine can cause uh, any of any pain, it can cause pain in any of those uh, locations. And so let's delve into some of the differential diagnoses for hip pain, um, especially in um, the young athletic hip. And so, you know, we talked about the fact that FAI obviously is prevalent, but there are other things that we should be thinking about that cause the pain. So one of those things that is not commonly understood, but is an important cause of uh, hip pain is subspine impingement. And that's an impingement of the anterior uh, inferior iliac spine or the AIIS. And so beyond the traditional form of impingement, um, you should really keep an eye out for AIIS impingement. And it usually uh, stems from an overgrowth um, of this part of your pelvis and it can cause impingements in similar ways that you can have FAI pain or femoral acetabular impingement. And so we generally will grade the subspine um, using a format of type one, type two, type three. And so in a type one subspine, which is uh, the top picture, the, uh, the subspine is flat. Type two, the subspine grows and it generally tends to grow to the point of the rim of the acetabulum, but not beyond it. And then type three, you sort of end up having a hook where the uh, subspine will then grow beyond the acetabulum and will pinch the femoral um, head and neck and also pinch the labrum as the individual flexes the hip. Um, oftentimes there is a history of um, some kind of rectus injury. You will oftentimes see um, this pathology in um, people who participate or have participated in kicking sports. And then obviously we, we can't forget about dysplasia. Um, in discussing FAI, it's really important to understand um, that patients can sometimes have FAI and also have dysplasia. Uh, and I like to think about hip dysplasia um, and general instability of the hip as being on a spectrum ranging from you know, frank dysplasia where um, there's really not much in the way of coverage of the femoral head to borderline dysplasia to then micro instability where, you know, things can, the bony structure can look normal, um, but the patient demonstrates evidence of micro instability. Um, and then this is in contrast to um, a hip that has a large cam deformity an alpha angle greater than 75, where, you know, this is a stiff hip. And the problem is that the hip is actually a little too stable as opposed to being un unstable. And you generally want to be in the middle um, between the too stable versus unstable in order to be a happy hip. Continuing on the theme of, you know, understanding the differential diagnosis that you have to uh, think through when thinking about a patient with hip pain, um, you know, really no talk on hips is complete without a little talk about or, or an acknowledgement of the pres presence of uh, hernias or commonly referred to as sports hernia. Um, you know, this condition goes by a lot of names and it's um, a condition of micro trauma to the abdominal wall. But you may hear, you know, you may hear it referred to as sports hernia, core muscle injury, 
athletic pubalgia, adductor strain, you know, these are all part of, um, you know, a uh, syndrome of conditions uh, relating to um, injury to the abdominal wall. And in my practice, when I um, see patients who have a sports hernia, I encourage them to exhaust conservative treatment options before con considering surgical treatment. Um, if there is evidence of tissue herniation through the abdominal wall, then surgery can be considered, and this would be in the form of a hernia repair. But you know, I think that most um, surgeons managing this condition would really advocate for an exhaustive treatment. Um, so we talked about some of the anterior causes of hip pain. What about some of those lateral causes of hip pain? Um, and so how should we think about the lateral cause of hip pain? Well, the most common cause of lateral hip pain is trochanteric bursitis. Um, and, you know, obviously I mentioned that you can't overlook lumbar spine pathology. And so assuming that it's not referred pain from the back, um, trochanteric bursitis is, is very common and reproducible on the exam, um, with palpation, with pain, um, to palpation of the greater trochanter. Um, and trochanteric bursitis tends to occur um, in females and in particular um, female runners. Um, and it can also be as a result of compensation or training on unbalanced surfaces leading to increased stresses on your glutes uh, and stabilizers of the hip. Um, and if you are seeing a middle-aged or elderly patient who has lateral hip pain, um, then you should think maybe a little bit beyond trochanteric bursitis and think about an abductor tear as a potential cause of the pain. So abductor tear meaning a tear of the gluteus medius and minimus. Uh, in my practice, I unfortunately will oftentimes see, um, you know, older patients who've had a gluteus medius or minimus tear, which hasn't been diagnosed. Um, has been injected multiple times. And, you know, the reality is that a, a solid repair of the gluteus medius and minimus um, can lead to really good outcome. And so um, continuing our rotation around the hip, so going from the front to the side and uh, thinking about some of the posterior causes of um, hip pain, you know, I think that um, the hamstring tendon tear, I think a lot of people are familiar with the presentation of this. Um, the hamstring can hamstring injury can occur at any level, um, and the muscle belly strain is the most common. But you know we all want to not miss a proximal avulsion injury, less common but certainly more serious, and it, it occurs with forced hip flexion and knee extension. And so you want to think about you know someone who's forced into a split position, um, and so for patients who have muscle belly injuries or who have a single tendon tear and you know patients who have uh, a full tendon tear with retraction i would say you know two centimeters one centimeter or less um, you can certainly manage them conservatively but for um, two tendon tears tears that have significant retraction or even partial tears um, at the uh, level of the tendon attachment at the ischium that have had pain going on for greater than um, six months and they have failed physical therapy and injections I think that those are certainly um, good candidates for surgical management. And so um, switching gears here, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how I think about the clinical evaluation of um, FAI. Now, now we've sort of gone through our differential diagnosis. We know some of the other things that could be causing hip pain um, beyond FAI. How do I um, then examine for FAI? And so um, when you think about the patient who comes in with FAI, they are oftentimes young, active athlete, although, you know, I'm certainly not ageist. Um, you can have uh, FAI in older patients who have a well-preserved joint. Um, in terms of uh, the symptom onset, it's usually variable. Um, and patients will oftentimes have a history of chronic or mild discomfort. Um, they'll describe... Um, you know, sort of these non-specific um, pain, um, and then in some cases the pain can be, um, you know, lateral in nature. They oftentimes will have poor hip flexibility. The C sign is is pretty classic. When I was a trainee, you know, I, I thought that the C sign was something that was really just made up. But you will be shocked at the number of patients who will uh, come into your office 
um, really clutching their hip in describing the C sign in terms of how their um, their their hip is presenting. And I oftentimes will try to elicit it by saying to patients, you know, if you could point with one finger, where is most of your pain? And they'll say, well, it's, and then they'll do the C sign. Um, patients will oftentimes also describe mechanical uh, type symptoms that involve popping, locking, clicking, and catching. Um, there can be a history of, um, you know, dysplasia or other uh, hip disorders in childhood. And then you also want to think about the uh, coexistent pathologies. You always rule out the lumbar spine. And so when I think about examining the patient who comes to me with hip pain, examination of the hip really is similar to other joints. Um, you have taken the whole clinical picture, which involves, which includes uh, examining the gait, the alignment, alignment and the lumbar spine. I do a screening exam of, of motion and I'll typically load the facet joints um, and see if this is a, a, pain, a pain source. Then I'll move on to palpation. And so there are lots of muscles around the hip, but I will oftentimes will palpate, you know, the greater choke, the glute, the hip flexors, and try to understand if, if there are muscles that are contributing um, to the presentation of, of the pain. And so um, I'll try to value for a hernia as well. And then next, I'll look at the range of motion. And we've talked about the mechanical conflict um, of the uh, cam deformity. And you can get a sense of how large someone's cam is without even looking at the x-ray. Um, and so with my range of motion, I'll pay specific attention to hip flexion, internal rotation. Internal rotation is very sensitive, in my opinion, for a large cam and impingement. And then after that range of motion, I'll move on to um, my special exams that are very specific for um, impingement specifically the fader, flexion, adduction, internal rotation maneuver. And this picture um, shows here how to do the fader. Um, then there are other tests, such as the subspine impingement test, and then the faber. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about these specific tests here in a second. And so um, let's talk about the fader and the subspine. So these two tests are really my... Um, workhorse tests for hip impingement. So the subspine test is, uh, subspine impingement test is done by bringing the hip into straight flexion. So um, no internal and external rotation, just a straight flexion of the hip um, and try to understand if there's anterior impingement of the hip um, at the level of the AIIS. And then you can introduce um, adduction internal rotation. And this test, um, both are performed in the supine uh, position, but the fader, um, is very sensitive for intraarticular pathology, um, specifically the labrum. If there is um, pain with uh, the impingement testing of either the subspine or um, the, the fader, um, that will confirm for me that the diagnosis is more, most likely to be impingement. And, you know, the, the important thing here to note is that, you know, patients will come to you with hip pain. And you will put them on their back and do a fader. And it's most likely to cause pain. I, for example, don't need surgery. If you did a fader on me, it probably would hurt. It's really important to ask patients when you're doing the fader on them to um, ask them, does the test reproduce the pain that brought them in? If it's a different pain that brought them in, then, you know, it's the labrum tear, which I told you is present in, you know, 40 plus percent of people is probably not the problem. And so um, then I will also oftentimes do the FABER. And so the FABER is a flexion, abduction, external rotation maneuver. Um, and uh, the FABER test really examines hip pain in the abducted position. It's performed by laying the ankle of the affected side across the thigh of the unaffected side, um, sort of putting them in this figure four position. And I find that the Faber is helpful when you use it in combination with other tests. And so um, anterior hip pain with the Faber can point to anterior hip irritation, um, oftentimes meaning that there's a psoas problem. And then posterior pain can point to an SI joint dysfunction. And that's usually how, in my mind, I like to think about um, the Faber. Um, for some people, when you put them in the Faber, it can cause pain on the lateral and that can signify trochanteric uh, pain. 
Um, and so then moving on, um, there is also another test that I like to have in my armamentarium, and that's the posterior rim um, impingement test. And it really looks for um, either impingement posteriorly or anterior instability. Um, and so in order to uh, perform this test, the patient is positioned at the edge of the exam table so that their legs are hanging uh, freely at the hip. And then the patient draws up both legs towards their chest. Um, and the, the reason why they do that is that essentially eliminates lumbar lordosis. And then the affected leg, the leg that you want to examine, is then extended off the table combined with an abduction and external rotation maneuver. Um, and then positive tests will tell you, you know, if, if the pain is posterior, it will tell you that there's posterior impingement. And if the pain is anterior, it will tell you that the hip is unstable and that they have micro instability. And for me, that's an important test, especially in um, adolescent girls, for example. Um, you know, let me know that this is a hip that, you know, I have to utilize um, special surgical techniques to make sure that I don't destabilize um, the hip um, with my surgery. And so um, switching gears to talk about the radiologic assessments of uh, hip pain, I always start with an AP pelvis of the hip. There's a great deal that can be learned um, from just this simple study here. And so first I will evaluate the degree of hip arthritis. Um, and the reason why is that arthritis is such an important prognosticator of outcome. Um, and, you know, oftentimes people will, will talk about tonus grading, um, and that's the most commonly used measurement for arthritis. Generally, patients with a tonus grade of two tend to do worse with surgery. And so tonus of zero means no arthritis. One, they have some sclerosis and slight joint narrowing. Um, and then two, they're starting to show um, cysts, or they have moderate joint narrowing, loss of sphericity of the femoral head, and then, you know, tonus three, they have severe uh, joint space narrowing. I oftentimes will also measure the amount of joint space that someone has. Um, and generally, if someone has less than three millimeters of joint space, um, I would say that they are not a good candidate for surgery. And so then after looking for arthritis, I will then evaluate for dysplasia. I generally use the lateral center edge angle, although um, some people will argue for uh, something called the fear index. Um, the lateral center edge angle, I think, is the most commonly known measurement to assess hip dysplasia. Um, and to measure the center edge angle, or the CEA, um, you draw a line perpendicular to the axis of the pelvis through the center of the femoral head, and then you connect um, this to the lateral most portion of the short seal. And so a normal center edge angle is considered to be between 25 and 40. Borderline hip dysplasia is between 20 and 25. And then a dysplastic hip is less than 20. And the reason why it's important to understand a borderline dysplastic hip is that, you know, in some cases, a borderline dysplastic hip can do well with arthroscopy. Um, and then obviously a frankly dysplastic hip you want to consider things like a periastabular osteotomy. And then hips that are overcovered are hips that have a center edge angle greater than 40. Um, and these are what we call pincer hips. There are a number of lateral views um, that are described. In my practice, I get the 45 degree done. I feel that this captures the anterior femoral head neck junction the best and allows for appropriate visualization of the cam deformity. And so on this lateral view, um, you're able to assess for the alpha angle. So the alpha angle um, you know, really is the quintessential angle in hip impingement. Um, and so the concept of the alpha angle um, basically allows us to look at the loss of the sphericity um, of the, of the uh, femoral head and neck. And so um, in the white here, you can see um, you know, a large alpha angle. Um, and an alpha angle greater than 45 is suggestive of a cam deformity. And so um, you can see the difference there once you add, um, you know, that extra bone in the white, um, it increases the alpha angle and leads to loss of femoral head neck sphericity. Moving on from the x-rays. So, um, 
you know, I oftentimes will get an MRI in patients with hip impingement. Um, I think that MRI is, is very critical, especially in people who have failed conservative treatment options. Um, you know, there is uh, some controversy around the use of MRA. And so, you know, I, in my practice, there's really not a role for MRA. Um, and, you know, I can just speak to what my practice is. Um, you know, I think that with a, an appropriately um, high resolution scan, you're able to see all the details that you need. However, sometimes things can be equivocal, at which point you um, can then inject the dye to do an arthrogram. Um, in patients who've had a prior hip arthroscopy, who you want to evaluate um, for the um, you want to evaluate for the integrity of the labrum or the capsule, an orthogram can be helpful because um, it will look for extravasation of the dye. I think that M an MR is, is critical beyond FAI to evaluate other sources of hip pain. Um, and so, you know, I would say that for a patient who's tried physical therapy and their x-rays are unremarkable, um, and they come back to you and they're still having pain, an MRI is a very powerful diagnostic tool. And so the impingement can be quantified on the MRI. Um, and it can also tell you how bad the label tear is. It can tell you if there is um, involvement of the cartilage, thereby making you, you know, expedite referral to a surgical source. It can show bone edema. Um, and it can let you know if there is um, stress impingement MRI can also be helpful for diagnosing other conditions that you have on your differential diagnosis that you may not have been thinking of. So, um, you know, these three images on the bottom um, show other conditions that uh, cause hip pain. So the image on the left shows a torn uh, conjoint tendon of the hamstring with distal retraction. And so the issue of tuberosity um, is shown, and then the retracted tendon, which is supposed to be attached there, um, is retracted distally. And then on the on the in the middle MRI, you can see that um, the glute muscles are um, torn and are not attached to the greater trochanter, um, and that there is a fluid uh, signal there consistent with um, a tear of that tendon. Um, and then in the image on the far right, you can. Um, start to see, um, you know, the inflammation uh, in the bone um, consistent with uh, someone who has um, core muscle uh, dysfunction. And so CT imaging um, can be a very useful adjunct to an MRI, especially in people with um, femoral cerebral impingement, FAI. Um, I oftentimes get... Um, you know, a CT if someone has had a prior surgery or if something on their examination makes me um, question their rotation of their hip. So specifically their femoral version, um, you know, because if someone has a lot of femoral version, that can actually uh, cause them to or contribute to their degree of impingement. And so you want to get a sense for um, if someone has significant femoral retroversion or excessive antiversion, because you may want to also consider um, a rotational osteotomy um, as part of their um, treatment for their impingement. So let's talk about um, injections. And so um, injections, I think, are very critical um, in the management of hip disorders. Um, you know, the hip is unlike other joints in that you know, we don't routinely do a diagnostic knee or shoulder injection, um, but because of the overlying, overlapping pain sources that I talked about earlier in the talk, um, diagnostic injections can be very helpful in the hip to confirm that the pain is indeed coming um, from uh, intraarticular hip sources. And so I, I'm a proponent of in-office injections for diagnostic purposes, especially in patients with FAI. Um, I will, I, either I or my colleague, Dr. Robinson, will perform an ultrasound guided um, intraarticular hip injection with lidocaine or Marcan in the office, and we'll repeat the provocative maneuvers, we'll repeat the fader, and try to understand, um, you know, if the um, anesthetic relieve them of that pain. 
Um, and this can be really helpful confirmatory step for both the patient and the provider. Um, if all the pain is resolved, then you know the person it confirms that the pain is from inside of the hip joint and that they may benefit from um, you know from surgery. I tell patients that the amount of relief that they get from an intraarticular lidocaine or marcaine injection um, is similar to the relief that they will get um, at the end of their rehabilitation course from from surgery. Now, something that's important to note is that you know in approximately 15% of cases, you know, even if someone has a treatable um, intraarticular uh, source of pain, they may not get better with the lidocaine or marking. Um, and then you also have to think about the therapeutic purposes of the injection as well in the office. So um, I think that a steroid injection done in the office can be very helpful for the management of hip osteoarthritis or um, for patients with FAI who really want to maximize non-operative treatment options. And so um, I will offer a steroid injection to my patients over the age of 35 who have FAI. There is data that's been published that shows that um, for people who have FAI who then go on to have a labor repair, um, they have um, worse outcome if they've had a prior steroid injection. So as long as the patient, you know, my, as long as the patient under 35 understands that, um, I'm happy to offer them a steroid injection as well. Similarly, for patients who have a trochanteric, uh, who have trochanteric bursitis or partial thickness tears of their glutes, um, they can be helped with um, a trochanteric um, bursa injection. Um, my, oftentimes my sequence will be one uh, trochanteric bursa injection of a steroid and then escalate to um, PRP, plate rich plasma. Um, I, I will refrain from doing multiple steroid injection into the glutes. Um, similarly, for reasons of um, you know diminishing the, the tissue's healing ability and the you know ability to recover if surgery is needed. And then um, similarly for partial thickness tearing of the hamstring or hamstring tendonitis, um, steroid or PRP um, can be very helpful. And specifically for um, hamstring, partial thickness tearing of the hamstring tendon, there's good data to support um, the use of PRP in patients with this problem. And so um, switching gears a little bit to um, the treatment considerations for FAI. So, you know, Obviously, you know, I, I'm a surgeon and I, 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 let, I gave you my full disclosure, I'm a surgeon, but I fully understand that, um, you know, half of the cases of hip impingement do not absolutely need surgery. And every patient with FAI should at least be tried on three months of physical therapy. So, you know, start with that. And there are examples of people who have FAI, even in professional sports leagues, where the athlete has been able to successfully avoid surgery with physical therapy. And this is an example from the professional tennis circuit. Um, you know, this is Kevin Anderson, took some time away from the game, worked on therapy and hip deficiencies, was able to come back and successfully compete in Wimbledon the following year. And um, these are, um, there are a number of well done studies that highlight the efficacy of physical therapy for patients with FAI. Um, you know, I would say that the best known study is the UK fashion trial um, that was published a little over five years ago now. Um, and the study um, showed that when patients were randomized to PT versus surgery, both cohorts demonstrated um, significant improvements um, in um, their outcome. And um, but what it showed was that um, after, after about six months, the surgical cohort um, had better outcome and um, some of the um, improvement that the physical therapy cohort um, experienced uh, diminished. And so there are so, some patients who will do well with physical therapy and will continue to do well and others who won't. And I think that those are the people who um, would benefit the most from surgery. And so when thinking about who are the people to try for physical therapy for an extended period of time? Um, I would say that oftentimes the patients who have identified deficiencies in either their glute activation or their core are the people who are best for <clears throat> an exhaustive treatment of physical therapy. And so I, I will recommend that the start of the PT that all therapists 
work to establish a baseline and identify um, imbalances, especially in the glute. And I think that when these imbalances are normalized, that's when there can be a best resolution um, for hip symptoms. The other thing to not overlook is, um, you know, oftentimes um, patients who have FAI will have significant muscle imbalance. And so a dedicated soft tissue program can really be helpful um, for addressing any residual pain. So, you know, sometimes patients will come to me and they'll say, hey, you know, I got 60% better physical therapy, but I still have this anterior hip pain. And that's when, you know, <clears throat> good, <clears throat> good examination can be helpful. The, the patient has still has anterior pain, but their fader is a lot better or gone, but they have tendons palpation over their psoas. Um, and so that's when you can send them back to the therapist and have the therapist focus on soft tissue mobilization or find a myofascial release therapist. Um, and so the four structures that I generally recommend for therapists focus on are the adductors, um, the TFL, um, QL, and the psoas. And, you know, look, in some cases, you can do as much PT as you want. And, you know, the patient just won't really get better. They're going to have a stiff hip. And, you know, in some cases, you know, you can have a hip at risk where you can have, you know, a very young patient who has a large cam and the MRI shows that they're already starting to have significant cartilage wear and, and joint damage. And, you know, I think that these are the patients that, you know, really um, do well from surgery. Um, and so <clears throat> when we perform surgeries in patients who have hip impingement, we're really trying to get an excellent correction of the cam deformity. As, you know, truthfully, I would consider the labrum to just be an innocent bystander in hip impingement. It's really the cam that's the bad actor. The cam is a central protagonist and it's the cause of the limited rotation and increased damage to the labrum and cartilage or the pincer if there's a pincer present. And so these shots here are um, fluoroscopy shots um, from surgery. And so the hip on the left is pre um, cam resection. And so, you know, the instrument, the two instruments, the, the, the instrument up top is the camera and then the burr is touching the cam. And so then the goal of the surgery is to restore the anatomic femoral head neck offset so that the hip can rotate smoothly. And so, you know, together my team and I at HSS, we've been able to establish a good evidence base reporting on successful outcome of arthroscopic FAI surgery for patients who failed appropriate PT. And I generally quote patients um, a 85 to 90% success rate with FAI surgery if um, they do not have a significant burden of arthritis um, or associated um, spine disease. And so um, looking at my time here, I, I've kept true to my time, uh, less than 45 minutes. And so we're going to move on to some, some questions um, to see how much um, you all have um, absorbed from my talk. And so um, I believe that there's going to be a way for you to um, potentially answer the questions and we'll go over the correct answer as well. Um, so um, first question, 16-year-old uh, female dancer who participates in ballet, tap, and jazz presents to your sports medicine clinic with right-sided groin pain. She denies any specific traumatic injury preceding the pain, but notice that it started about four months ago. Since it began, it has steadily worsened and is aggravated by activity. She knows that sometimes she can feel a click in the hip on the right side. When you examine her, she can hop on either leg without pain. She has mild pain with deep squatting. She localizes the pain to the right hip and groin area. While supine, she has normal range of motion of both hips, but flexion, adduction, and internal rotation of her right hip produce significant discomfort. You suspect that she may have a, she may have suffered a labral injury. Which of the following findings would most increase her risk of a labral tear? So um, you have four answers here, or four choices here, and there's one correct answer. So I'll give you a little bit of time to think about that, and then I'll reveal the correct answer.
we'll give the question another uh, 10 seconds. Okay, great. So you all get you all guessed correctly, or at least ninety five percent of you guessed correctly. Um, so the correct answer is is A. Um, and so the presence of cam lesion on the hip X ray um, is something that will support your concern that she has a labral tear. Um, and some some of you thought that maybe it was B, distant history of an ASIS avulsion fracture that was treated non-operatively. Remember, the subspinal impingement is AIIS. Um, and so that, um, you know, there is there can be an association with AIIS and uh, labral pathology, but um, that's not what was mentioned here. Um, the Barlow and Ortolani test um, is a test giving at birth for dysplasia. And so um, you know, a negative Barlow and Ortolani suggests that this person does not have dysplasia. And so that would be an incorrect answer. Um, and then recent addition of hip strength and exercises after each dance class would actually help. Um, and, um, and so that would be an incorrect answer as well. So, all right, moving on to the next question. So a 30 year old male presents with worsening uh, hip pain over the past six months. He points to the area of the groin as the area of maximal pain and demonstrates a C sign. Um, he recalls stepping funny in a pothole a few years ago while running, but no other tra traumatic injury. He reports pain is worse with internal rotation of the hip in yoga. He reports catching without locking. You suspect the labral tear um, with possible FAI. Which of the following clinical tests would be most helpful for you to confirm your suspected diagnosis? And so... Um, you have four choices here, and so I'll give you a little bit of time to um, think through those um, choices and to pick the right answer. There is one right answer. Give it another five seconds before completion. Hey, great. So um, 90 percent of you guessed correctly. Um, so um, the correct answer is B. So when we when we talk about impingement testing, um, you know, you really want to focus on the um, flexion, adduction, um, internal rotation maneuver. Um, and so um, the question asked specifically for you suspecting a labral tear. Um, and how you can um, confirm your diagnosis. The fader is um, very s s sensitive um, for a labral tear. Um, and we discussed, um, you know, fader um, can point to other diagnosis and investing in concert. Okay, so um, keep, keep moving with the questions. And so the next question, um, a 39-year-old female with a past medical history of moderate persistent asthma um, with recent exacerbation requiring oral steroids, presents the clinic with a one-month history of progressively worsening right hip pain. Um, there's no inciting event or trauma. The patient localizes the pain to the groin area. Examination shows limitations in range of motion due to pain, negative favor, but positive fader. Hip x-rays are negative. What is the most likely diagnosis? And so you have four choices here. Give it another 10 seconds on this one. Okay, great. So 95% of success rate or uh, answer correctly. So um, the answer is A, um, avascular necrosis of the femoral head. And so, um, you know, when you think about the rapidly uh, progressive cause of hip pain um, in someone uh, who's under 50, um, AVN is certainly one of them. And then, you know, here it did mention that, um, you know, this particular patient required oral steroids. Um, and so, you know, not, not just an inhaler, the inhaler they, they were treated orally with steroids. 
Um, and you know, the fader here lets you know that there's intraarticular um, findings and cause of intraarticular pain. Um, the while the X-ray is negative, um, X-ray can be negative um, in people who have avascular necrosis, especially if there's if it's very early and there's no subchondral collapse. Um, you know, you would uh, most likely be able to see it on the MRI. Um, and so going through the answers, hip osteoarthritis um, is likely, um, you would see that on the x-ray, um, so the x-rays are negative, um, the hip add Dr. Strain. Um, you know, I think that while that is a, a good thought, um, you know, you would, you would not um, expect them to have a positive fader um, and limitations in the range of motion due to pain. And then greater trochanteric bursitis we discussed earlier is, is a lateral um, cause of, of pain. And so, so yeah, we were able to successfully get through our questions. Um, and, um, you know, I think that, um, you know, if there are any questions from the audience, I'm happy to entertain those and answer those right now. All right, Dr. Wanchuku, this is Myro again. I was just, I put it out in the chat and I said, if anybody had any additional questions, no one has any questions right now, but I had a, a couple of just quick questions. Um, just, I know you talked about having worse outcomes uh, with doing like label repairs after a corticosteroid injection uh, into the hip. Is that within like several months of that injection or is that something that you see even down the line, like maybe even a couple of years later? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So the particular study that demonstrated this well, um, it was a database study um, with a thousand patients. And um, those patients had surgery uh, ranging from, you know, six months to a year um, after the steroid injection. And those patients were found to have, um, you know, lower patient reported outcome measures um, at a minimum two year follow up. And so, you know, there's no, we don't know the time-based relationship, but it's pretty consistent with everything that we've seen in other body parts, right? So, um, you know, when you inject a steroid to someone who has a full thickness rotator cuff tear and you then repair the rotator cuff, they have higher risk of failure and re-tear of the rotator cuff because the steroid impedes the ability of the tissue to heal. And so um, I think that there's a twofold risk. There's one, there's the immediate risk of the steroid where, you know, if you were to do surgery on someone within, you know, two months or six weeks of them having a steroid injection, there's an increased risk of infection. And then, then there's just the long-term risk where once you've had an injection of, of the steroid, the, the ability to, of the tissue to heal is less. Um, there's a question in the chat from... Um, Alicia Carter, um, what are the recurrent rates of CAM lesions or intraarticular mediated hip pain after surgery? Um, it, it's a, a really good question. So um, a recurrent rate of a CAM lesion would suggest that the CAM grew back. And, you know, we know that CAMs tend to form during adolescence and during growth. So the CAM will likely grow back if you shave down a CAM and someone who still has an open growth plate, that femoral head. Um, you know, if you shave down a cam in an adult, it's unlikely to grow back. It really doesn't grow back. The cam is really more of a residual cam than a recurrent cam, meaning that the cam wasn't fully shaved down the first time. And, um, and so that's the most common cause of a revision arthroscopy is a residual cam deformity. Um, and um, the second part of the question was intraarticular mediated hip pain. So, you know, I, I think that there's always a risk of a re-tear of the uh, labrum after surgery. And, you know, we, we looked at our registry at HSS and, you know, the rate of needing surgery again for um, an intraarticular cause of hip pain um, was generally around 4%. And Ben, I don't see any other questions at this point in time. Um, I'll give it a I'll give it a couple more seconds if anybody else has any additional questions you want to ask. Okay. 
Well, I think I think that's it. That was that was really good. Thank you. Um, I think that was a very comprehensive lecture, not only about FAI, but also the things that could be going around and make sure that you're looking into like anterior lateral posterior things that could be causing that hip pain. Um, I am I really enjoyed the the lecture and and how you went over some of the the ways that um, you go ahead and go from like conservative into a surgical treatment, as well as also recommending the physical therapy for that three months. So that's, that's good. Uh, uh, physical therapy prior to even having, uh, any consideration for surgery. So that's good. Um, I will ask that if, uh, Andy, if you can go ahead and drop the, the survey or the, uh, survey into the, into the chat, if anybody's still on, if you can go ahead and do that. And again, please join us next week uh, for Dr. Osagera and HWNT. Uh, uh, was it um, his lecture? So thank you again, Ben. Thank you all for your time. I appreciate the invitation. Take care. Okay, you too. Bye now. <laughs>